Subsidiary Issues, Part A. She says, when during the recitation to the teacher, his text is in the hands of someone else and this person may be relied upon, is attentive to what is recited and is qualified for this. If the teacher knows the material recited to him, it is as if his text were in his own hand, only better because of the cooperation of the mind of two people on it. If the teacher doesn't know the material recited to him, there is some disagreement about the validity of the transmission when he is not holding his text. One of the authorities in legal theory held that this form of audition is not valid. The preferred opinion is that it is valid and most of the teachers and scholars of Hadith act upon it. When the teacher's text is in the hands of the reciter and he is someone who may be relied upon in regard to his religion and knowledge, the verdict on it is the same and it is in fact more deserving of being considered valid. When the teacher does not know the material recited to him and his text is in the hands of someone who may not be relied upon to hold it, and whose, neg whose neglect of what is recited may not be guaranteed against, it is the same whether he is the reciter or not, for it is not an audition which may be credited, and Allah knows best. That's part A. Part B, when the reciter says to the teacher, X informed you, or you said X informed you, or something similar to that, while the teacher remains silent, listening attentively to it, comprehending it and not objecting to it, then this behaviour is sufficient to establish the accuracy of the recitation. Some of the Vahiris and others have imposed the condition that the teacher must verbally assent to it. The Shafi'i jurists, Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi, Abu Fat Sulaim al-Razi, Abu Nasser, stated this unequivocally. Abu Nasser has said, the student may not say, he transmitted to me, hadathana, or he informed me, akhbarana, without his teacher's verbal assent. He may act in accordance with what was recited to him, and if he wants to relate it from his teacher, he should say, I recited to him, or it was recited to him while he was listening. In contrast, it is related from some writers that one of the Zahiris stipulated that the teacher must express his assent upon the completion of the audition, through the reciter asking him, is it as I recited to you? And he has to affirm yes. The correct view is that this is not necessary. The obvious implications suffice, and the silence of the teacher in the aforementioned fashion takes the place of his explicit endorsement of the reciter. This is the doctrine of the majority of the scholars of Hadith, Juris, and others, and Allah knows best. And uh, some, some uh, uh, reciter uh, and uh, who are sophisticated in Polish, they will say, فأقربه. he assented to it, or say, and he said, yes. So it makes distinction between the two. So we say, فأقربه, without mentioning his wording, meaning he remains silent. But you know then, depending upon your school of thought, what to do. But, but obviously, if a teacher is, uh, knows his material in an exacting way, like Malik, then it's no difference if he did it, or say, because This objection is not it's not, it's not really great, it has great validity, because uh, people like Malik and all, all those who are uh, sophisticated and give the manuscript to one the students, usually the one in the halaqa is the first, best one in, in reading and uh, with minimal errors and so on. And if the teacher correct, correct them, so he groom people for reading the halaqa. Not everyone reads the halaqa. And only the first class one reading. So this is guaranteed by, by, the, by yeah. the situation. So, is his objection then to cut? Like so, any it is expected for the teacher to say, "No, I, this is not my hadith, or I don't know this one." Mm -hmm. If he remains silent, yes, this is that's that's an approval. But uh, there are cases, for example, when the teacher is known, for example, that he uh, that he is very lenient and uh, and uh, his books are in people's hands, like Ibn Duhiya of Egypt. That's one of his problems that. Uh, uh, sometimes they read to him things and he did not object. And some people criticize him. Why didn't you correct them or something? Say, my books are available in everyone's hand. Mm. If these people are fabricated or weak, this is not my responsibility. But this is not good. That's one of the reasons Allah is very controversial. Mm. And some nation, some people narrate for him filthy things because they read to him and he did not clearly object. Or take books which are, which are not, uh, or, 
bought by the by the by the from the publisher, which have not been verified and double checked properly, which we can trust hundred percent because maybe someone may have overlooked a line or jumped with his eyes. All all the famous problems mm-hmm. with with uh, written trans- transcription, and the teacher is supposed to correct that to the students, mm-hmm. and he did not do that. Assume that student will will correct from each other because plenty of his copies are around. So they should be self corroborating But this is not necessarily so by every student that he will do that. So that made Babel Lahia a matter of controversy and, and criticism ongoing until now. And this is, this is the reason they only take uh, the regard as his uh, hadith is only reliable if it's transmitted from the older early generations. Uh, when he was younger and the, the, the older generation were more exacting like Abdullah ibn Mubarak and Abdullah ibn Wahab. The more recent ones, only those who had certified by independent verification. For example, Qutayb ibn Sa'id is one of the younger generation, very late, relatively late. But his hadith are clean. So Ahmad wondered, how come that your hadith from Ibn Lahi are all clean? If we check them with Abdullah ibn Barak, they seem to be clean. So yes, we used to read to, to uh, Ibn Lahi, and he was in his lenient way. And in the way back, we passed at Abdullah ibn Wahab, who told us, come here, I will verify with my books because I have the originals with me. So they verified with Abdullah ibn Wahab, who is an authority on Ibn Lahi. So but that, this is some of the late, later ones. So if you know about that, like for example, Qutayb ibn Sa'id, that's no problem. And others, you know, but only the earlier ones. And especially the problem because in the later few years, only three, four years, but that's a problem. Even the three, four last years, maybe younger generation are rushing to the old man to have high snad, and you have tons of narrators. Uh, his books were banned and so on. So he was relying on the people having that from Warraq and reading to him. And his memory is not the best in that age. And before that, he had an accident and uh, uh, has a stroke or something. So he's not in the best mental and bodily composition. Which, uh, so from the, so unless you know it is someone who hid him very early or someone who hid later but verified by, by passing at Ibn Wahab because Ibn Wahab was younger than him. Not by many years, but about maybe, yeah, by 20, 30 years. He's his student, but from the older generation, and being an Egyptian, he started studying him in very young years. Those who verified with Ibn Wahab and uh, checked their, their manuscripts with Ibn Wahab, these are accepted and reliable. And they're, they're known by name. Mm-hmm. You can list them. So that's an example. He mentions that that's, that's because this is Ibn Lahia, but in the case of Malik, and this is a pity because Ibn Lahia is the most comprehensive collector of the Egyptian uh, narratives. Mm. Nobody collected from Egypt as him. There's a later Ibn Sa'ad who is more exacting, much more exacting, high, very high authority. But a later Ibn Sa'ad, instead of collecting from Egypt, he traveled to Medina and collected from Nafi and so on in his younger years. Well, at that time, Ibn Lahia was going to Egypt from north to south, east to west, scanning every village, every place to collect every narrative. So it would be a pity to lose that. But this such a precaution is good. Uh, it is it is being more exacting and picky so that you have it as a proof. But all narratives which have been delivered by Ibn Lahia I have ever seen, they are all good essentially. Independent who hear from him. But you cannot make it as an argument against someone mm-hmm. say, Oh, this from Ibn Lahia Ibn Lahia is questionable. Unless you can say, No, this is an old an old transmitter or this is someone like Qutaybah who used to be verifying his his uh, Records with with Ibn Wahab. So that's, that's if such, such qualifications must be must be taken into consideration. But generally, what he said is that what is this is no normal and more reasonable thing. He makes the distinction about Zahiris uh, uh, and. Uh, it's just that the Sheikh must say yes. That's what. Uh, what uh, where is that coming from? Just because they say a cent is, we cannot argue, we can't accept for the Prophet when he remains silent because he's unfallible, for the others fallible. Maybe he's not focusing properly, so he has to say yes. So that we are absolutely sure. If you want absolutely sure, yes. But even in that, if it comes to people like Malik and so on who are known to be very exacting, they wouldn't insist on that. And they wouldn't even check it. In later generations, Manuscripts were uh, anyway very clean and they were d- double checked before, so it is just a formality to keep the snag chain ongoing <coughs> to make sure that your copy of the book which is being sold in the market is a verified and clean copy, corrected copy, if you would say. Because our Rakhil became very professional, they were writing very nicely, but still 
the possibility of overlooking of mistakes are there. So if you attend and verify your manuscript to, to someone reading to the sheikh, no need for him to say yes, it's correct. Because you have already essentially 99.999% correctness. Mm-hmm. Or this may be just one, one word misspelled or one line, maybe in a, one in a blue moon has been overlooked. And you want to guard against that. That's it. So it's minimal. So theoretically, the Wadahari are correct, but in practical life, this is guaranteed, especially in the later generation. In the early like Sahaba and Tabi'in, this was an was tahdith. There was no, no tradition of reading to the Sheikh in that sense. He either dictates or there was, there was sometimes reading to the Sheikh or he, you, you, for example, uh, uh, Jabir has his own Sahifa. Someone wrote for him, a very reliable man. And uh, he uh, made a to Jabir, presented him again to double check it. And then Jabir said, you go to so and so and take a copy of his sahifa. This is enough. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it happens by many. But many in the imagination did not like that. For example, Qatar said, ah, someone came, gave, gave me the sahifa of Jabir. And then memorized like Surah Al-Baqarah, but I throw it away. Because I did not get from Jabir. And uh, the intermediary, although trustworthy, but I am not sure if it has been verified properly. So... All of these things, the early phase. The early phase was the hadith. Sahaba and tabi'in. After the tabi'in, everything is essentially on record by various people, how exacting they are and so on. So this is summarizing the experience of various generations before. Later on, after the books are, everything is essentially in reporting books, things become far more formalized, attendance and uh, this why attended and years and, uh, and signature on the manuscripts and so on to make sure that has been read and to have these safeguards. All this is just books. Paragraph C. According to what we hear, the expert, Abdullah al-Hakim, may Allah bless him, said, in transmission, the procedure I prefer and the one I saw most of my teachers and the authorities of my era adhering to is for the student to say for the material he took verbally from the speech of the transmitter while he was alone, ex-transmitted to me. Yeah, yeah. And for the material he took from his speech in the presence of others, X transmitted to us. Hadathana, yeah. For the material he personally recited to the transmitter, he should say X informed me. Akhbarani. Akhbarani. Mm-hmm. And for what was recited while he was merely present, Akhbarana, Akhbarana. X informed us. That's, that was like uh, roughly starting after Tayyip Ahmed bin Hanbal, this became essentially the convention. But some give better clarification. They say, for example, أخبرني قراءة عليه. Well, I mean, just to clarify things. In the case, the convention is not clear to everyone. Many scholars use that. But أخبرني has become in the later. That's the reason you see here, for example, for Malik, because Malik, they're yeah. usually reading to him. And if you are the reader, this أخبرني, if someone is reading, because only one reader in the class is there, few, uh, one may relieve the other or someone gets sick, another replacement. But only few are having such a good voice. It has to be a strong voice. He has to make very few mistakes so that Sheikh does not need to correct very often and so on. And uh, some are stubborn. There was one Egyptian who used to read to Malik and was making could almost continuously mistakes. And Malik said, give to you. He said, no, no, I must read to you, Sheikh. And so Malik sometimes, he makes the mistake say, Okay, if you insist on the word is like that, can you explain the meaning to me? Because it's meaningless. It still is reading. <laughs> I think that. So you have sometimes stubborn people, and the sheikh does not want to offend them. He's coming from Egypt, such a long distance. And you don't want to 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 uh, off- offend someone like that, to give him a chance and so on. So you have all these things. But the one in the halqa knew about that. And we're mocking this guy. And so he's still insisting to read. And making the same tasheef again and again. Sometimes if Mari correct him and he makes the sahib by reading again, his eyes just stuck. Then say, okay, if you insist that the word there, can you explain me the meaning of the hadith? <laughs> it's just meaningless. <laughs> so all of that can happen, but uh, that's obviously in presence of others in a halaqa and so on, yeah. So if you're analyzing a chain then, and you've got the various hadathana, hadathani, akhbarna, akhbarni, you can then you can, tell yeah, yeah. who has especially in the later generations who's yeah. done a, a yeah. verbal reading who's done yeah. the reading from man just yeah. from the chain itself yeah from the chain itself and Malik was very uh, very tough for the so Shaban Ammar who died at 240 say when I was very young my father collected some money I think he sold the house and gave it go and 
go and take hadith from Malik. So I went to the halaqa. I didn't like that this people are reading. I wanted to read him or that he dictated to me directly. So I followed him to his house and said, what do you want? I said, I want you to make the hadith to me. So he called his servants and beat this guy. <laughs> Several sticks. So I started to say, why are we big? How can we impolite? I said, my father sold the house and gave me a few dinars to come to you. And then I got beaten up. So, okay, then come in now. <laughs> now you'll dictate. This is really, it was not good that I did. So he dictated to him. So one of the few which Malik dictated to me. <laughs> I caused you this story. Then he attended the regular halakha. I said, he attended the other people. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody there going to Malik and saying something. Should and another one, and, uh, <laughs> another one, which has very, very, uh, it has a character which the people in his presence feel very, very respectful. Ibrahim bin Abi Talib in Khurasan. And uh, one who was attending his halaqa said, We were other than Both of them are great scholars, they are well known. And then he, he got a, a sneezing, so he healed the sneezing back. So I tell him, whisper him. You can't sneeze in liberty. We are not a prisoner of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Don't worry, sneeze. Because <laughs> even in Salah, you can't sneeze. It's <laughs> Ibrahim, is such a personality. <laughs> As if the birds are there on the head. Don't worry, we are not a prisoner of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sneeze. <laughs> so, but back. Uh, so, it was later, it was everything was disciplined and all record and so on. Like, for example, they doubted someone. And, uh, uh, taking from the sheikh in the problem because he was very young mm-hmm. and they doubt, doubted him and they were accusing him of lying and so on because he said Haddathana wa akhbarana he was not there and then someone traveled to I think it was in Damascus he was supposed to have uh, that word Medina in Damascus and he checked the records they kept in the mosque and found his name and his presence and came back said the man is telling the truth he was young but his father took him early there mm-hmm. and he was recorded as present so how can you claim that he was not present and lying because normally most people will start really studying and learning by 15, 20, like the Kufi in yeah. 20, possibly by 10. We see if someone is sharp. You don't send the dull boy by 15. It's not the case. <laughs> but you know, the very sharp ones. But uh, uh, later on it became even six, seven years. By six, seven, the moment he can. Uh, and some of them are sharp. For example, one uh, uh, narrator from the family of Bahloul. And this family is just like the inherent exactness and truthfulness over generations, he tells his son that I started, I, uh, I started writing from, uh, uh, from your grandfather at, uh, at the age of eight and nine. And by nine, he was distinguishing various forms. If he's reading to, to, to the grandfather or the, someone reading, he writes that in the Isnad. So all of them in my record with nine years. He had that discipline. So this, these people were extremely highly exact. Except you say I was distinguishing everything. The things are read to him, the things people read to him, the things who were alone, because he's his grandfather, so he can read to him at home, and the things who were in a, in a, in a halaq, all of it is recorded in my snaps. You can verify them. Nine years old. Okay? That's a nice level. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable level of discipline. Mm. He says, also, we indeed had something similar to that from Abdullah ibn Wahab the disciple of Malik, mm-hmm. and we pleased with him, it is extremely good. Mm-hmm. If a transmitter has doubts regarding something in his possession as to whether it falls under the heading of he transmitted to us, hadathana, or he informed us, akhbarana, or under the heading of he transmitted to me, or he informed me, because of his uncertainty over whether he was alone or with others at the time of the reception and the audition, it is possible for us to say, let him say, he transmitted to me, or he informed me, because the absence of others is presumed. Mm-hmm. However, the authority, Ali ibn Abdullah al-Madini, has stated from his teacher, the authority, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qahtan, that the transmitter should say, X transmitted to us, Haddathana, for the material regarding which he is uncertain, whether his teacher said, X transmitted to me, or... X transmitted to us. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. This would require that the transmitter himself say he transmitted to us. Mm-hmm. When he is in doubt over his own audition in such a case, in my opinion, this is possible because he transmitted to me is more complete in terms of rank and he transmitted to us is more so effective. So he wants to, to express himself in, in a more cautious way. So if you are not certain 
what the Sheikh said or that you are alone. I said that you should assume that other people they are listening. Because transmitting to you alone is having a higher rank. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, uh, like you are, you are a relative of the Sheikh and you can't see them at, at home and so on. This is, and this means if this hadith is odd and not other people find it easily, you have been given that in a special session, being a relative or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it gives, it gives it a higher rank. But if you are in doubt, make it a lesser rank. Always. And if doubt was, did, did I write that hadith and memorize it when, when the, when I was reading, someone was reading to the sheikh or it was in his dictation? Because some sheikhs do that and that dictation station. If you are doubtful, is it from the wording of the sheikh with his voice or from someone reading to him or it was read several times, you, you don't know the version you wrote at which time, then you say then akhbarana, take the weaker one. Mm. Always has to be the cautious side. And if you doubt, doubtful this one, an. But I said for generation from like Ali ibn Madini and Dihaj al Khattar, they started becoming very exact. Like for example, I mentioned once that uh, Abu Dawood said, and in, um, in this hadith, when, uh, when uh, we were uh, at near the end of the hadith, my paper finished. So I wrote it from one of uh, the people who were attending with us, Tathabat Min I verified it because he memorized it and I verified it with him. So I have to, I memorized it, but I verified with his writing also, double verification. Mm-hmm. But he mentioned that in the Isnat. In, the, in, in his book, you can see it until now. It's recorded there. So he did not take liberty or something like just by saying an or something. Mm-hmm. And this is of importance, especially, it is very important, for example, if you're dealing with people who are mudallis, mm-hmm. to make a difference. And the mudallisin take liberty if they say an. Like Ibn Juraj is very bad in Tadlis. Usually if he said an, then you can assume safely the one from whom the an is, uh, has been dropped the name, is, is very weak and very poor. Almost, almost certain. Mm-hmm. And this is, so you find for the hadith coming in a version, like the hadith with the, not building over the grave and not using gypsum and so on. Clean one with haddathani and so on, everything connected. And the best students have taken that for him. And other students who are not the best, they're good, but they're not the best, they take it with an, and then he sneaks and not writing on the grave. And this is inter, not, he never heard it from Jabir or from Abu Zubair. It is another intermediary. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he mentioned him, sometimes he drops him. But in any case, even if he mentions him, it's no good. Because I worked recently on that, so I checked all channels. Mm-hmm. No good channel is there with, with the kitab Ali. It's clearly, it's clearly a very poor one. So someone like Ibn Jirish was so in such exacting control, mm-hmm. it's very important to know the word in which he's, which he's using. Mm-hmm. So you can isolate that as an addition. Isolate. And then you say addition is weak. Yeah, it's yeah. weak. It's, for all, it's most definitely fabricated even. Not by the man he dropped or the man who was reporting, but he, he did this, the man himself doesn't know where he took it. He doesn't remember. Sometimes he said from Jabir. He never met Jabir. Sometimes from the messenger of Allah directly jumping over <laughs> two generations. So meaning that he did not make half of his not. So it's, it's, it's completely an authority. And the reality is that this is a sign of weakness. In that case, it's clearly a sign of publication because no other channel in the world came with this except this one. So it can't be. And all others are usually related to graves have come from various channels, not mm-hmm. only from Jabal, but from many others. Four, that five, him unreliable then? Oh, this one is unreliable, yeah. This one is unreliable. This shows that he's, he's not... Uh, He's not an authority by himself alone. So everything he'd be struck out then if he's adding something. Not come no. no he, he he got it somewhere but he does is not exacting where he got it. Mm-hmm. So he's not fabricating but it doesn't uh, it, sure someone is fabricated and was sneaked it on him and he did not notice. Mm-hmm. All of this could happen. Like in writing, if you see the level of standardization about the transmission errors of writing, including that, for example, uh, in the Jewish tradition, they have always this issue with, 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 uh, with flies. What's the issue with flies? Because they write with a thick, with a thick, uh, uh, ink. And they have to put it in the sun to dry. To penetrate in the skin or in the, in the paper, the papyrus. In that, the dots may, a fly sitting there and making a dot could confuse a dot. So the, the students, the scribe has to stand there, push the flies away until everything is dry and you exchange it. And they say, we, we take care that there no fly comes to that or a fly may come and obscure something. Yeah, and then you find that in the Jewish tradition, that's discussed also. Yeah? No, no, it, it has to be done. 
Because at that time, that's the only way you can transmit. And they explained many variations in text by issues like that. It was not dried properly. It was uh, some insect attended it while someone was negligent and so on. In comparison to very la- the reliable, uh, because this is all written material, the reliable trans- uh, 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 transmitter. Besides, obviously, having two people doing the same and double checking because someone I could jump, the other one would not be jumping. Two of different characters, choosing the people who have uh, uh, an eye for this. Because not everyone has an eye. For example, most people, when they read the material, and there are test cases. For example, there are English text. Uh, you find it in the internet in which most most vowels have been taken, and still you can read it. Speed reading, uh, not a speed. It's just printed like that to test you, and then you still make sense of it and read it, thinking the vowels are there because your brain is conditioned that the vowels are there. That's the reason Arabic we don't need vowels most of the time, mm-hmm. which is understandable in English, and still you are able to understand quite well. So there may be a vowel missing in the writing, and. You overlook it simply because you read the way, the, the way you are used to read it. Mm. But maybe that's not what's standing there. And that's one of the reasons the issue with the paracletus in, in, in John. What, what is, there are two spellings. One spelling meaning the praiser, Ahmed. Mm-hmm. And one meaning the comforter or the avocat. And in one old manuscript, I think in the, in the, in the Sinai manuscript, it is clearly, uh, uh, spelled as Ahmed, the praiser. Par- paracletos or this paracletos, just a difference of two of one vowel. So sometimes one vowel could be significant. Mm. Hmm? So, and in written transmission. So these things could be sometimes uh, quite uh, of considerable importance to be very exacting, especially when issues related to, to aqidah or halal, halal and haram. Issues of history and so on are not of that great importance. Usually this will not change much of things. But issues of, of uh, law and so on has to be much more exacting. So even those uh, Jews and Christians, but that's indirect transmission. The origins of the book originally who wrote them, that's the problem. Either the, the original composer, the, the unknown, of it, that's the problem. But after it has been written once and regarded as canonical, the transmission is very reliable. And very, very reliable. For example, there was the discussion going for hundreds of years when the Renaissance started, when the criticism started. And they said, how, how can you trust uh, the Masoretic text? It is, uh, the, the text of the Old Testament in, in Hebrew is essentially codified this way we have it in hand in the 10th century in Egypt and Palestine and the Islamic rule. So they were the, the so-called critical scholars. They are not critical, but they are biased because they are having an atheistic uh, and they want to undermine the scripture as not reliable. They were discussing the reliability for the longest time until the Dead Sea Scrolls came. And it turns out that that transmission says for a thousand years was almost exacting. And if there's any mistakes in variation, you can expect that either old variation of spelling because spelling change over generations and centuries or things of this, of this, uh, of this type. So that's is uh, being exacting, and that is is having a having a great merit. It should it should be, it should be, uh, uh, it should be, uh, it should be taken care of. So let's continue with the next point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He says, so when the transmitter is in doubt, uh, let him limit himself to the defective form, because the absence of the additional person or persons is presumed. Mm-hmm. However, this is a fine point. I found that the expert, Ahmed al-Bayhaki, has chosen the view that I presented above. That is the preference for me. After quoting the statement of Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qahtan, Qattan, Qattan, just uh, Making the distinction between me and us on the principle uh, of uh, al-Hakim is desirable but not mandatory. Mm. Al-Khatib related this view from all of the scholars of Hadith. Thus, it is permissible for the student, when he hears hadith by himself, to say he transmitted to us, yeah. or something similar, because in the speech of the Arabs, that is permissible for a single individual. Yeah, we'll say in the plural, yeah. Further, furthermore, he is permitted, when he hears hadith as part of a group, to say he transmitted to me, because the teacher did transmit to him, as well as transmitting to the, to the others. others yeah. so, it is, so it is not that... It's good to keep that desirable as the way the Hakim insists to have. But we have said, Qatan said there's no major difference here. 
If it's hadathana, as it is, it is spoken, that's fine. Only the difference between hadathana and akhbarna makes sense because in that one, the sheikh himself is dictating with his own voice and the other, someone is reading to him and he's approving. So the difference is good. But also some are very lean there. They make no big difference between akhbarna and Anyway, essentially, this is connected. The more important is connected. Mm-hmm. But generally, the distinction between akhbarna or akhbarna and hadathana and hadathana is made, but in between akhbarna and akhbarna, they are not that... that uh, that stuck like a hakim would love to have and was usually practiced also but it's not a condition any for reliability or anything paragraph number d we heard from ahmed bin hanbal who said follow the speech of the teacher in regard to his saying he transmitted to us he transmitted to me i heard and he informed us and do not go beyond it for the material you find in the books composed of the transmissions of people earlier than you you may not change the hadith indicated with he informed us in that very book to he transmitted to us and the like. That is because if there exists a disagreement over putting one term in place of another and there exists a precedent for making a distinction between them, it is possible that the person using one of them is one of those who does not regard them as equivalent. If you were to find an isnad or that description and you knew that its transmitters regarded the terms as equivalent, then you're replacing one of them with the other would come under the heading of permitting transmission by paraphrase. This would be true even if there were a well-known difference i.e. between the terms observed by others. We think it best to avoid doing anything along these lines in regard to changing the contents of books and collections of hadith. Yeah, as you should transcribe the exact thing. You should not change anything of that what's already been transcribed. As, as you find it, uh, report as it is. But if you don't remember it, and then you just, you know, it's, it's a speech or ceremony or something, that Han, you can use Han. So you say, because it's not a matter of discussion now, is it authentic or not? I think that's being settled already. So, um, because Al-Bukhari reported from his teacher, so on, so on, because he doesn't remember this, he said, Akhbarani or Haddathani. That's okay, because it's in the Bukhari, the reference. But if you are doing it in a, in a session or in a writing, as an evidence, it should be exacting. What prevents you from copying it exactly as it's there? I Meaning you are too lazy to go and check these things. So you are yourself not a reliable translator then. So would that have the effect of downgrading the authenticity of the particular hadith? No, I don't downgrade your authenticity because the hadith is already in books and well established, but mm-hmm. that means you are not an exacting person. You just haphazardly are quoting. But if you are in a ceremony of Jum'ah or something, this is not a place of scholarship, it's a place of general. Normally, obviously, even they don't give it's not in Juma, but some they do give. If they give, try to give it as accurate as it's in the book. Uh, he continues, what Abu Bakr al-Khatib has said is in his uh, kifaya about doing that is disputed. And in our view, it refers to, to the hadith student, to the hadith, a student hears from the speech of a transmitter and not something recorded in a written composition. And Allah knows best. Paragraph E. Scholars disagree over the soundness of the audition of someone who copies at the time of the recitation. It is reported that the authority, Ibrahim al-Harbi, the expert, Abu Ahmad ibn Adi, the professor, Abu Ishaq al-Isfarahini, uh, Isfar- Isfarahini, the expert in practical and theoretical law, <coughs> and others, have rejected it. Uh, we heard that Abu Bakr Ahmad ibn Ishaq, one of the authorities of Shafi in Khurasan, was asked about the student who writes during an di- audition. He said, he should say, I attended, and not, he transmitted to us, hadathana, or he informed us. It is reported that Musa ibn Harun uh, al-Hamal permitted copying during the audition, and that Abu Hatim al-Razi has said, I wrote in Arim's class, while he was reciting, and I wrote to, I wrote in Amr ibn uh, Marzouk's class while he was reciting. Uh-huh. It's also reported that one text was recited to Abdullah ibn uh, Mubarak while he copied another. There is no difference between the copying of the auditor and the copying of the person who validates the audition. Uh-huh. What do they mean by that, in terms of writing, as in writing a different text? While he's with a speech? No, no, uh, while uh, uh, dictating. So in other words, you're better to memorize and then write later? Or you have your own copy from the Warraq and you're correcting it. Because your, your focus will not be 100%. 
Abdullah al-Barak, if he was writing something, so I read him to him, he has the capability of following two things. This is, some people have this rare capability. This is, mm. But this is a rare man. This is not a standard. This is not a standard. There are very rare cases where someone could uh, could use both hands at the same time and write it. Very rare cases. We have, a ca- we have even a case of one that's, I think it is Athram. Unfortunately, he became Muqallid of Ahmed al-Hanbal and just rejected his own intelligence and sharpness because they used to say he's so sharp, one of his parents must have been a jinni, not a human being. And uh, I think the same person, another one also, that sharp one, two, 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 uh, two hadith scholars came from Khorasan passing to Hajj and they were giving halaqah at the same time in the masjid. So he sat between the two halaqahs and wrote from this and this at the same time. So, but these are rare cases. This is not, not the standard. The standard is that the Sheikh dictates. Usually they read in, in a certain speed that it's, uh, they were at the time there was no short hat invented. You will not be able to follow with the, but it seems we, uh, we have the example of Dawood, he said the paper finished, meaning he was, but this Sheikh may be dictating slowly. Mm. Or repeating the hadith twice and so on, reading from manuscript. Some Sheikhs do that. So it depends. So there's some variation there. But, the best, the best is that, and this is the later generation that is, because most of that is the later when things become formalized. There's, there's Warraqeen. You go and get all you get from someone who had auditioned before you. You get his copy from his copy. And then your attendance is just to verify and certify and have the connection directly to the Sheikh. So it's it then, effectively. No, no, because you are attending to the Sheikh. Ijazah would be, you are not attending. He send you an Ijazah, said. For example, Abu Nu'aym al-Asbahani, the one of, of, of uh, Hiliyat al-Awliya and so on, when he was six years old, his father wrote to some authorities who were very old. He was afraid they will die before he, and asked him ijazah for his son. And they know the father. The father is also a great Hadith scholar, and he has 35 copies. They say, we make ijazah for your son to report these from us. Mm. And then he reported saying, ijazah ali. Sometimes Abu Nu'aym said, akhbarani, and that he was criticized for that, for ijazah. Mm-hmm. Because Akhbarani is not for Ijaza. But it's not very much, not very often, but he did that. And they regard that as kind of tadlis. Mm. He should say, Akhbarani Ijaza, or Ijaza Li. So this is this. Then he says, making a distinction is superior to these blanket declarations. Mm-hmm. Our opinion is that the audition is not valid when the copying is such that the student cannot comprehend what is being recited. So that sound which reaches his ears is like background noise. Mm -hmm. The audition is valid if, while copying, comprehension is not impossible for him. As was the case in what we heard regarding the hadith expert and scholar, Abul Hassan Dara Kutni. In his youth, he attended the class of Ismail As-Safar. He sat copying a volume in his possession while Ismail was dictating. One of those in attendance said to him, your audition, your audition is not valid while you copy. Uh, Dara Kutni replied, my comprehension of the dictation is different from yours. Mm-hmm. Then he said to the man, do you recall how many hadith the teacher has dictated until now? He replied, no. So he said he has dictated 18. And the hadith were counted and found to be as he said. Then Dara Kutni said, the first hadith was x from y and its text read such and such the second was a from b and its text was such and such he kept giving the isnads and the text of the hadith in the order that they were dictated until he reached the last of them and the people were astonished by him this is a special case this is this is uh abul hassan ali ibn umar darqutni we'll get that someone like that once in a hundred years These are the guys which were one, one in a generation. Usually in one generation you have only one of this time or two. What period was he from? He was uh, in the 4th century. So he died uh, 350, 360, something like that. Like that. Uh, he was the sheikh of, of, uh, of Al-Hakim. So for 380 maybe he died. So he's fully in the 4th century. <coughs> the same has been reported from Bukhari also, we know. From uh, we have previous generation, for example, Shaab wanted someone to with him to do mudakara, so he can. Do you remember this hadith? And so it keeps fresh in your mind. And then someone introduced him to Ahab, Sayyid al-Qattan. 
So he would did mudakkar and then told the man who brought him. But then Jaysa stayed with him 20 years until he died. He said to him, you do not bring me home, but you can bring me a shaytan. <laughs> <laughs> like some, like that. So like, like, like these exceptions, these are there. Or Qatada, who was blind, you know, like a recorder. Mm. And then he'd go to Sa'id ibn Musayyab, stay eight days. And then Sa'id say, what do you staying? What do you want to stay for anymore? You have... You have exhausted me. There's nothing Brain. left. You drain me <laughs> completely. The Zeftani, Ahmed, blind man, get lost. Oh, so enough is enough. Uh, paragraph F. It says the distinction which we described in regard to copying applies equally to the cases when the teacher or the auditor is holding a conversation, or the reciter speaks too quickly, or murmurs so that some of the words are inaudible, or the auditor is too far from the t- from the reciter. In similar cases, it's obvious that in <laughs> Each of these cases, missing a small amount, a word or two, may be excused. If this is the case, it is recommended that the teacher permit all of the auditors to tr- to transmit the entire volume, all the book which they heard, even if the term, audition, is to be applied to all of it. When he grants his written authorization for that book to one of them, he should write, He heard this book from me, and I hereby give him permission to relate it from me, or something similar to this. Just as some of the early teachers used to used to do, one of the things we hear from the Andalusian jurist Abu Muhammad ibn Abi Abdullah ibn Attab was that his father, may Allah be pleased with both of them, said, "In audition, licensing is indispensable because sometimes the reciter makes mistakes and the teacher ignores it, or the teacher makes mistakes if he is reciting and the auditor ignores it." So the portion the student missed is restored to him by the licensing. What we have mentioned is an excellent solution. Indeed, we heard that Saleh ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal has said, I said to my father, when the teacher slurs a word, it is known to be such and such, and this is not understood from him. Do you think that the student should relate the correct wording from him? He said, I hope that there will be no difficulty in his doing that. On the other hand, we read uh, that Khalaf ibn Salim uh, al-Mukhrami has said, I heard Ibn Uyayna saying, Amr ibn Dinar to us, meaning Amr ibn Dinar transmitted to us. However, he limited himself to the noon and the alif of Hadathana when he was told, say Amr transmitted to us. He said, I will not say it because I did not hear three letters of his utterance, Hadathana, and they were on account of the great crowd. The crowds of the classes of many of the greatest transmitters of Hadith used to be very large, sometimes reaching thousands and thousands. Tens of thousands, even what? Sometimes 30, 40,000, 100,000. So no, just not only one reciter, there would be a chain of reciters. For example, when, uh, when Suleiman ibn Harb visited Baghdad, uh, a pulpit was placed for him so he can recite and the Ma'moon was behind the curtain listening also at the time of Khalifa Ma'moon and then uh, he recited and there was one repeating after him at head to attend and they would say we are not hearing say stop this is not going to work call so and so and Harun something Harun came say all other reciters were told to be silent and he was like thunder everyone heard and they made a made a mess mess uh, Measuring the distance and the thin length and the width and make an estimate how much a human because everyone was sitting almost next to another one. And they, and this was just, just for a visit to Baghdad just with the Khalifa present. I think they, they, they calculated something like 30,000 next to the palace of the Khalifa in an open place. So this Harun, uh, some, uh, Harun al-Mustamli, some of the one who takes from the Sheikh and pronounce to the others. Say so Harun said, everyone remains silent. No need for all your ten. Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> was enough for everyone here that they, all, they wrote. I think that Al Bukhari had 70,000 in some of his auditions. We had, for example, for people after Al Bukhari, we have 100,000. We have even the century before, even the Shuikh of Bukhari and before, we had had cases of 30,000, 20,000. Enormous numbers. In that case, you have to have a dictator, someone dictating. There was no megaphones at that time. And not everyone is having a thunder voice like this. How will it Yes, he says, 
The crowds in the class of many of the greatest transmitters of hadith used to be very large, sometimes reaching thousands. Uh, repetitors you conveyed the hadith yeah. from the teachers to the crowds, so the students actually wrote the hadith down from the teachers through an intermediary of the conveyance of assistance. Yeah. More than one of the experts permitted students to relate that, that material from the dictator without mentioning the intervening repetitor. Yeah. Because it's like a repeating machine. They are professionals and they paid for that and they are very exacting. And the sheikh will verify them and listen to them and make sure that they are, because he hears all of them. And, and other, other first class students are distributed nicely so they can double check all of that. So that's, that's very reliable. There's no problem in that. That was good as a copying machine now for written material. And he said, we heard uh, that Al-Amash, may Allah be pleased with him, said, we were attending the class of Ibrahim Al-Nakai, and the teaching circle became And this is in the first century. This is where Ibrahim Al-Nakai died a few months after the Hajjaj. Hajjaj died in 95, and then they told Ibrahim the Hajjaj died, he makes you shukr, not Allah, because he was <laughs> hiding. And then several months later, I think he was struck with a disease, Rahmatullah, and died quite early. Age-wise, he was, I think, 58, maybe. So did not reach him, by the way. So what was he said about Ibrahim and Nakhais? Uh, he said the teaching cir- circle became very, very large. Many times he related hadith, and those at a distance from him could not hear it. So they asked one another what he had said. Then they related these hadith directly from him, as well as those they actually did hear from him. Yeah. And we heard that a man asked Hamad ibn Zaid about a similar situation, saying... Abu Ismail, what is your opinion? He said, ask those around me. We also heard that the repetitor, Abu Muslim, said to Ibn Uyayna, many of the people <coughs> cannot hear the hadith. He said, can you hear them? He said, yes. And he replied, then make them, then make them hear them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you should be a bit doing the repeating job then. Others have rejected it. Uh, we heard that Khalaf ibn Tamim said, I heard about 10,000 hadith from Sufyan al-Thawri, and I used to ask my companion in the class for the ones that I did not hear clearly. I told that to Zaida, and he said to me, transmit from these hadith only what you have preserved with your heart and heard with your own ears. So I cast them away. Mm. Uh, because Zaida is very exacting and very, very, uh, very uh, picky. Depending upon character, Zaida is one of the great exacting so he will only the things he has here. He will not rely even in people in the class. Uh, we also heard from Abu Nair. But later on with the Mustamli, the official Mustamli, with a voice like thunder and so on, so this is almost like a copying machine. It's exact repeating. And at that time, everyone has his manuscript already from, from the Warraq. And then he goes to the Halaqa just to verify things. Uh, we also heard that Abu Naim felt it necessary to transmit from his fellow students the hadith from Sufyan and Al-Amash, from which he missed a single word or name. He had to ask his fellows, for not thinking that anything else was possible for him. The first view represents an extreme lack of rigour. Indeed, we heard that the expert, Abu Abdullah ibn Manda al-Isbahani, said to one of his students, X, for you smelling a hadith is enough for audition. (laughs) <laughs> this statement should either be interpreted to refer to something else or to be left with the person who said it. I I found from the expert Abdul Ghani ibn Sa'id from the expert Hamza ibn Muhammad with his isnad that Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi said smelling a hadith is enough for you. <laughs> yeah, you just, just hear it casually. <laughs> Well, sometimes they have expressions which are difficult unless you, someone has clarified. Yeah. Uh, Abdul Ghani said, Hamza said to us, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi means that when the person was asked about the beginning of something, he recognized it. It does not refer to laxity in audition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the meaning of, uh, just the was the same space smelling to express that, that the moment you see, you recognize the first of it, you know what's it. So you smell it right away, just by, yes, with, with the slightest contact, you get it. Because normally, smell is the first one. If you meet someone who is perfumed, then the first thing you perceive is perfume or something like that. So they took it from that. But sometimes these expressions are a bit obscure. You have to know what's the, 
uh, I think we must mention that he was Yahya Ma'in when he has been a son. He's He's nothing mm-hmm. or something. Else. This could be from that he's a liar. He's worth nothing. Or sometimes means he has very few hadith. Why we are bothered? Mm-hmm. And he's even very reliable. So you have to see from the context. Unless and further we're adding which uh, we say he's worth nothing. That's something else that he's very weak. Huh? Mm. But if just nothing, la shay. Barely any hadith, four or five hadiths is not worth dropping our head with it. And all of them are just other chains of other hadiths. So why should we put our head about this man? Mm. All of the hadith he is transmitting has come from other more famous people. So la shay. But he's still reliable. Paragraph G. Mm-hmm. Audition from someone behind a barrier is valid if, when he relates the hadith personally, his voice is recognized. It's also valid when the hadith are being recited to him if his presence behind the barrier is known to one of those being granted the audition by him. For the recognizing the teacher's voice or presence, one should be permitted to rely upon the word of someone trustworthy. They used to hear hadith from Aisha and the other wives of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, from behind a barrier. And, and, the curtain, yeah. and they related those hadith from them on the basis of their voice. Mm-hmm. The expert, Abdul Ghani ibn Sa'id, cited as proof of the permissibility of this practice the statement of the Messenger of Allah. Bilal will call out at night, so eat and drink until Ibn Umm Maktoum calls out. Abdul Ghani also related with his isnad that Shu'abah said, when someone transmits hadith to you and you do not see his face, do not relate from him. Perhaps it is a devil who has taken his shape, saying, he transmitted to us and he informed us. And well, Allah knows best. Shabba is obsessed with these things. <laughs> but this is not... Uh, because uh, there would be obviously corroborating evidence that there's a devil. But if you go to the house with the Prophet and where his wife talk behind the curtain, that's his wife. Mm. There's no female <laughs> devil inside. So... so Clearly, but this is such such something is so rare that. But if there is someone you don't know, or you know little, then there's a problem because the wife was unknown. So if you don't have seen the face, you can identify him. If you meet him again, then the the, the Shaba is most likely rela- relating that the, some people in the first century, when issues of fitr were ongoing, said, mm. "I was in a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting and the man, I barely remember his face, said this and this and this." Said we don't recognize him. The people do not know him. Maybe he's the shaitan, but present there try to misguide the people because this is an unknown entity. Mm. The first century they were lenient. If that's claimed to be a sahabi, then nobody would object to that or a great tabi. But how can it be hundred percent? So you must know that this is the man lived so and so on, and who is known for the people to be a sahabi because anyone can claim to be a sahabi. But in a, in, a, in a crowd, like in the masjid, say, uh, I saw the messenger are doing that, and the people present, all of them are silent, meaning he's a sahabi, and they know he's a sahabi, it's tawatul. So, things like that. Fine points, but it's obvious. It is, uh, the circumstances will dictate what, what to do about these things like that. But ha- not necessarily seeing the face. If he's giving a sermon, or giving, giving a ma'adha in the masjid, and hundreds of people are present, and they're silent, and nobody's saying he's not a sahabi, then it's different. You don't yeah. see his face. You don't know how he's, if he's, his beard is long or short, but you're hearing his voice and everyone's here. We get from the Sahabi, so on, so on. That's an easy. Paragraph H. When a student hears hadith from a teacher and the teacher then says to him, do not relate it from me, or I don't grant you permission to relate it from me, or he says, I did not inform you of it, or I recant from my informing you of it. So do not relate it from me without his ascribing that to his having made an error in the hadith having doubts about it or something like that. But rather he forbids the student to relate it from him, despite being unequivocal that it is his hadith. That does not nullify the student's audition or form an obstacle to the student relating it from him. Because sometimes then for political reasons, he's afraid this would be spread that cause mm. problems for him and so on. So that's, but it is, it is fair in this case to say, he told me this and this and then say, don't have a report from me. Like I, I saw a hadith, but uh, I don't. I don't think it's is authentic. It goes that uh, to Zuhri that he was going through Sham, passing through Sham, going to the Roman Roman area for Ghazu at the time of Abd Malik and Marwan. And Abd Malik was maybe in the Ghazu or outside. The, so he was in a, in a in a in a qubba, in a in a in a tent which is like a dome. And he called him, come, and he said, uh, 
Some people say you are reporting a certain hadith. As though you already recognize what, what he means. So you come in the back of the tent. Said, the hadith about Ali, as when Ali was assassinated. Say yes, so many people told me, witnessed that the, the day he was assassinated, if you lift a stone in Bayt al-Maqdis, it was under, bloody under. So I'm going to say, it's true. I hear that. I think it's true. But don't report that. Say so I didn't report it to anybody because it's politically dangerous for him. Don't report it. So until he died, then I started reporting it again. I have to share this now to that. So it will be an mm-hmm. interesting, interesting negative for Al-Barif al-Marwan. <laughs> he knows that and still continue and he's still on him. And he's uh, cursing Ali on the pulpits, which continues until Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. So this is, uh, this is an uh, example, but this is for political reasons. There could be another occasion, like for example, Sharik narrated the hadith that uh, if Quraysh does not do good with this and this justice, etc., then take your sword and exterminate them. And then someone to go to Al-Hadi, Al-Mahdi, and said Sharik, the judge is reporting that. So he got him to, for interrogation. Said, did you report that to him? Said, no, I didn't report to him. And the man said, on me is it's an obligation if I have lied that I will go to the to the haram in in, in hajj walking with barefoot and all my women are divorced and more all my slaves are free. And the Imam says, You see? He cannot have said that with his telling that truth said. Al Sharik said, On me is the same like on him. So Al Al Mahdi was was happy. It seems to be there's some kind of mistake. And the man said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, this man is the most shrewd Arab ever you will find because he's a genuine Arab, not Mawla. He means on him, this clo- he has the same clothing like mine. Tell him to say the same expression. <laughs> <laughs> so say, say the same expression. <laughs> so poor Sharik said, I reported him. <laughs> came. Then there was a confrontation. <laughs> Sharik has hidden many years until Mali died. Because he was ordered him to get killed <laughs> because of the hadith. So sometimes the hadith could be life threatening with these tyrants. So you don't know about it. But if you report, if you think, uh, think it is endangering him, it will be fair. We just not report. After he's dead, nobody can let you then go, go and dig up his grave. Who doesn't have anyone to be dug after he's dead? So you can report and say he ordered me not to say. And some Sahaba told, for example, uh, I'm hurrying. Abu Huraira, but another Sahabi, so ask him, or someone of the Tabi'in, his close students, they ask him, uh, were there any tribes or any big families that Mr. Yara did not like from the Arab? Say, I'll tell you only if you promise me not to report that until I'm dead. Say, okay, so he was, he did not like Bani Hanifa, Thaqif, Bani Umayyah, and another fourth tribe. He hated those tribes, he did not like them. But don't report for me, because Bani Umayyah is in power at that time. <laughs> And things like that. So there may be some reasons, and you should comply. But it is your audition is correct. You have heard it, and you know it is true. The other one say, I am not sure. Don't report it for me until I check my Then it is mm. obvious you will be then for you. It will be then you are you are committing a treachery, and commit uh, committing an an act which shows that you are you are a weak trans- trans- transmitter or you are a liar. Because he reported and he doubted something. Say no, no, I'm doubtful. If it's like that, no, no, don't. Don't, until I, I check with my papers. Then you are obliged not to report. Like uh, Abu Dawud al was in Baghdad, and they pursued him to say, I don't have my manuscript with me, and I usually dictate from my Muslim. They insisted, say, under the condition, you don't report it or deal with it until I go back to Basra and check that dictate dictation and then send you any correction. Because I'm relying on memory, and he dictated 70,000 hadith. And then who in bed but was found maybe fifty, sixty errors and he sent that to Baghdad and writing to correct. So things like that. This is very clear that clear that is I'm relying on them in the memory, it is not exacting, you should not report until it's verified. Or you say he relied on the memory and told us don't report, but I still I reported it. But you have to specify it otherwise you are a liar then. You are reporting something. People expect it from the Sheikh. To be in the normal state, he dictates, which is from his book, and he's not. And this would be, would be essentially that you, the one who doing that, you are not a reliable transmitter. You are actually a fabricator. Then. And there's many, many who are greedy for hadith and trying to get high, it's not and so on, committed such mistake, and they were exposed, and they were finished. 
or that they were so sharp and so, but they took liberties in these things which, which destroyed them completely. Fully. Yeah. Then mm-hmm. he says, uh, the expert Abu Sa'id ibn Aliyak al Nisapuri asked the professor Abu Ishaq about the transmitter who intends his audition for a particular group and someone else comes and hears hadith from him without his knowledge of it. Question, is it permissible for that unintended student to transmit the hadith from him? He answered that it is permissible that even if the transmitter had said, I'm informing you and I'm not informing X, it would not harm X Mm -hmm. and Allah knows best. And because he is reporting it in a hadith session, and in the side did that, for example, that had a conflict. I don't know what's the reason because they didn't report to us, maybe political, maybe Allah Alam, with Ahmed bin Saleh al Musri, the great half of Egypt at his, at uh, Sheikh Limba at that time. And I think Ahmed Saleh kicked him out of the halaqa. But he wanted to, to, to listen to his hadith. So he came behind the wall, Vidar Ahmed Saleh is unaware, and, and in all these, uh, the side said, Ahmed Saleh informed us, or dictated to the, to the present people why I'm hearing. Without saying that he's hearing with his permission or not, because this is not relevant. Because we are reporting. This is a true report that he said that. And even say I'm, as he said, I'm reporting to you, but I'm excluding uh, Naz. That is your, your problem. You can't exclude him because he heard it and is directed to other people who are tra- transmitting it legitimately. Why should you exclude this man? You should have your fight, uh, fought in another, uh, another field of battle, not in this. Not by permitting someone to trans- transmit. Mm-hmm.